Today, we're going to be looking at the counselor and the diagnosis and the process of diagnosing and the relationship between that diagnosis, the counselor, and ultimately the client. So what we're going to explore is defining what diagnosis is and why we do it, the ethics and connection to diagnosis, what it means for practical purposes such as billing or insurance, and what the considerations that we really have to have at the forefront to be competent and ethical and to ensure that client welfare is always at the center of what we do. So we're going to start just by defining diagnosis. So I want to look at two definitions as we explore this together, assessment and diagnosis. Assessment is what helps us develop an in-depth understanding of our client or the mental disorder at hand. And so we want to do things like the Beck Anxiety Inventory or PTSD screens or um, in the other lecture in Module 3, I'm also going to talk about ADHD screens too. Diagnosis itself is a medical term and it can sound very medical model, but it is part of the process of what we do um, and at the core of the function of counseling, which is establishing a baseline of the client, knowing how to move forward with evidence-based treatment, really leveraging a relationship and growing together. So this term is an identification of the disease-causing pathogens responsible for illness. Now, when we look at mental health disorders, we know that there are things like genetic factors and environment. There's descriptive symptoms and somatic symptoms. Descriptive symptoms would be reports of the person's behavior, maybe your own observations, results of questionnaires and assessments. Somatic symptoms are looking at chemical and biological markers that go with it. And sometimes these can seem a little bit more physical health related than mental health related. And another thing to think about when considering diagnosis is um, this debate regarding dichotomous versus diagnosis versus spectrum diagnosis. The DSM-5 TR is very focused on spectrum-based diagnosis. You know, that's where you get your mild, moderate, severe. Um, dichotomies are more black and white. Either you meet criteria or you don't. And so in the United States, we tend to use spectrums because that's what the DSM tells us to do. But in other countries, other diagnostic protocol may look at dichotomies. And so it's good just to keep that in the back of your head um, when we're looking at maybe a cultural context or even considering the definition of diagnosis because it's not the same across the globe or across time. The DSM has certainly changed over the years as we've learned more. So again, we're going to move away from the medical model into more of a biopsychosocial assessment and treatment, and we still want to go through a process in which we're identifying the root cause of a problem. So just to be clear that the definition stands and that there's you know little that we can do about that definition, but there's um, a difference because of the humanistic nature of the work that we do. And so you know, we want to consider this definition as sort of a jumping off point, but also know um, that we kind of have to formulate our own definition of diagnosis. And that's something that will, you know, really help you identify your identity as a counselor is if you're able to kind of figure out what does diagnosis mean to me. And so when we look at the purpose of diagnosing, you know, we, we want to ask ourselves, why are we even doing this? You know, why are we putting a label on something? Does that even matter? Those are really big questions in the profession. Um, you know, I think that for most of you, you probably already know that we have to do it for insurance. Insurance won't pay if we're not doing it. Um, so, you know, if we weren't billing insurance, if the client was self-pay, would we diagnose? And it's it's a good question. Some clinicians don't. And it's a debate that's really just been going on for decades, but there are reasons other than insurance that we do diagnose. So I'll just kind of start with the insurance one first, because I already brought it up. Um, but basically you want to follow the money. If there is a diagnosis, then we can provide funding for treatments like therapy or medications. Insurances require diagnosis for treatment. You can't bill under an insurance carrier unless you've provided a diagnosis. And, you know, again, this can be a criticism of the entire process. I'm over here saying, like, take your time, be comprehensive, rule out every other possibility, get to know the person before slapping a label on them but the insurance company won't pay you for your services without a diagnosis. Um, so that's the point of going through the DSM ad nauseum in this class, even having you find the chapters each week. It's going through the process of touching and interacting and understanding where diagnostic criteria come from, how to find them, and how to be efficient to a degree as well as comprehensive. Because 
you do have to do this to get paid. So oftentimes a diagnosis needs to be made at the first session and don't freak out. Um, you can look at that as maybe a working diagnosis or a work in progress. Change it over time as you get to know the individual. Insurance companies also understand that a diagnosis can change over time and hopefully should as a reflection of the therapeutic process. How, um, how do we know the treatment's even working if the patient continues to meet the same criteria over and over again, or even if it seems to be getting worse? But, you know, I want you to see that, um, that although it is a necessary process, it doesn't mean it has to be a messy process. It does mean that it's something that you should do that you, it doesn't mean that it's something that you should do quickly and flippantly because you just need to provide it that first time. We do have to understand that, you know, we will evolve with our clients. We will know more over time. They will know more about you and feel more comfortable disclosing information to you. Um, and you can really lean into supervision here to help you out with making some diagnoses if you feel unstuck. Um, and again, this is one of those times where we don't have to be perfectionists. We might want to be good enoughists based on the knowledge that we have at the moment of the client and how open and honest they are about their symptoms. And the next bullet point here is talking about access to certain rights and services and protections under legal guidelines. In the United States, specifically, if you have somebody diagnosed with an intellectual disability like autism or learning delays, they fall under a certain set of rights that can receive a certain set of services that aren't accessible to people without this diagnosis. So, you know, maybe it's more federally funded programs. Um, you know, it's not just coming to see you in the office and getting counseling. Um, and diagnoses can also um, sort of function as a census for the government. You know, the government wants to know what proportion of our citizens are in need of certain types of care. So the government can start to look at shifting budgets toward meeting needs or changing policies, preparedness for an influx of treatment needs. Um, you know, I'm thinking about you know, overdose prevention and substance use disorders and knowing that overdoses continue to rise and rise and rise because, you know, people are coming into ERs over overdoses and the government's paying attention to, you know, how this has really trended over the span of time. Um, so spending more money on getting Narcan um, available and maybe budgeting towards getting overdose prevention workshops in the schools and, you know, um, at workplaces, all sorts of things. You know, there's a lot that the government, if they're willing to look at the numbers, can do with a lot of this information. Um, it also helps to streamline communication across individuals, doctors like your PCP, psychiatrists, occupational therapists, counselors, social workers, school teachers. You know, we're all using the same language to describe a set of symptoms and best treatment practices to work with a person. So you get a sense of uh, what to expect when you work with that person or that patient or that client. I'll kind of use those words interchangeably. Um, so if I'm working with somebody with OCD and they're looking for treatment, I can say, well, they're likely to be experiencing some level of obsessions, compulsions, maybe some rigidity in their actions, maybe some fear or anxiety. You know, I can communicate that with another professional and they can pick up where I left off. Or you can think of it kind of like a shared secret code or language between professionals or maybe even like shorthand. Information can be quickly disseminated between professionals by using shared terms or language. I've seen that I've worked with families um, and it's, you know, when they can get, when they get a diagnosis, it can give them a sense of hope or relief. Like they know that there's something going on, right? So if I have a family who's receiving or needing services and they're experiencing some challenges with their child and they don't really know what to do and they go get testing and they finally found out that this child has a diagnosis or, you know, what's really going on with them, then it gives them like, oh, there's a reason here. And now I have a path to move forward and look for the resources to support this person. And there can also be um, a lot of fear around this if you don't know what it is and you tend to maybe do some catastrophic thinking or go with the worst possible solution or situation for this. So how is my child going to live like this? Am I doomed forever? And it's like as soon as you have the name for it and a little bit of information about the diagnosis, it can really start to snowball for some people. And obviously it can be worth worse for some others, um, but it can also have the effect for some people that they're able to feel okay. Now I feel like I have a handle on it. You know, okay, there's a treatment plan for this and I feel a lot better and that sort of thing. So it can be an important element of getting a diagnosis. 
And then one of, in my opinion, one of the most critical parts of any assessment, um, like it's all well and good to be able to accomplish all those things that we've talked about and to be able to give access and rights and protections and be able to secure funding and be able to communicate and all that sort of thing. Um, But just thinking about each individual person who's suffering in some way, the most important thing, the greatest utility that you can get out of a diagnosis is informing treatment for the individual, informing what kind of support they need, what kind of assistance or intervention or therapy that they need for their life. And I found this quote on one of the websites. I was looking at some of the research on there, and they said that um, diagnosis is only as good as the treatment it leads to. And I was like, that that's such a good quote. I love that sentiment tremendously. You know, one of the criticisms I was always brought to is this, um, you know, if I can't get any information about what kind of therapeutic intervention is useful for this individual, then I don't really care what the diagnosis is as a clinician. Now, again, I get that there's a lot of reasons to get one, but in terms of how I want to advocate and provide services for an individual, the diagnosis doesn't mean anything if it doesn't tell me what I can do to help. And so there are diagnoses out there that are purely descriptive and they offer no information whatsoever on treatment. And honestly, and unfortunately, autism can fall into that category sometimes. And, you know, um, there's sort of this thought process out there of like, if you've worked with one person with autism, then you've worked with one person with autism. Because knowing that autism does not necessarily inform me of what kind of interventions are going to work with that particular intervention, particular individual, or what kind of things to even expect from them um, when we go to begin therapy. You know, every person with autism is so, so unique that, you know, just meeting criteria for the diagnosis doesn't actually tell me a whole lot about them. Another piece of this is we're ethically mandated to provide comprehensive, competent, ethical diagnosis. If we look at the 2014 Code of Ethics from the ACA, we'll look at Section E particularly. It gives us some very clear guidance on the why and the how of diagnosis. And I put a screen grab here um, and you can access it very quickly if you want to just Google it yourself. Um, But I know it's really hard to see, so I'm just going to like zoom in a little bit. Okay. So in E5A, proper diagnosis, take special care to provide proper diagnosis of mental disorders, care, and proper, right? Those are the keywords here. Taking our time and understanding the DSM and the client, we use techniques like personal interviews, which can be an intake interview, along with other sorts of assessments to determine client care. All of that is part of the why or the purpose we just talked about. We always utilize cultural sensitivity to recognize that culture affects the manner in which clients' problems are defined and experienced. If you look at diagnosis, we really want to ask, is it causing a problem for the client? Is it causing a disruption? Is it pervasive? If it's not, then we need to look at... um, We need to look at what factors might be at play. Think about ideas of social justice, oppression, marginalization. How might they be at play in how you're viewing a client or what the client is even experiencing? And I've also placed E5B and E5C together here because they kind of flow from one to another. And looking at these factors, looking at how marginalization, oppression, how factors within society and human culture and experience impact our intersectionality of culture, we also have to look at the historical piece that pathologizing of mental health has been happening for decades. We want to look at that. We also need to get curious about why someone might not want to come to counseling, open up, spill their life story, be totally and completely honest, or maybe why they don't want to change. And are we giving a diagnosis from a holistic and collaborative lens that takes into account trauma, current environment, and culture? Um, And then I want to talk about E5D2, which isn't on this slide, Um, but we can refrain from diagnosis under certain conditions that would cause a harm to client or others. We have to consider the implication of completing the diagnostic process and the conversation with the client when we discuss it. How transparent are we? You know, if you're working with somebody that's in the middle of a delusional episode or in the middle of a hallucination, do you want to tell them that they're psychotic? You know, that might not be a time um, 
that complete transparency would be beneficial to them. It could create harm to them. So these are things that, you know, we really want to reinforce in supervision. You know, talk to your supervisor, talk to any mentor that you have if you don't know what to do. You know, we don't want to make any of these decisions throughout this process in a vacuum. And also, we're not doing what feels comfortable for us. We're doing what has the client's best interest in mind. So once we understand the purpose, you know, what else do we need to consider? How does the client view their symptoms? If they're not struggling and you think they are, who trumps who? Are you the expert in the room or are they? Is it pervasive to the client or not? Do they even want treatment? You know, maybe something clearly is a problem. You see it, they see it, but they don't want to change. Environment, social support can be factors in this. Um, and as you'll explore this week, environmental factors, especially with conduct disorders, are impactful. Was there chaos? Was there trauma? Was there ex extended periods of exposure to violence? You know, what do parenting styles look like? So I'm just kind of trying to tie these lectures together, module three. Um, culture, the crux of who we are, the intersectionality of all of our identities, race, gender, age, ableness. How do these play in? How does the world play in? How does it brush up against our clients' cultures? And do you feel comfortable exploring your clients' perceptions of you in the session? And culture can certainly tie into counselor bias. Are you seeing what's there or are you seeing what you want to see? Are you seeing anxiety instead of trauma? Because maybe you're just tired of working with trauma and don't want another PTSD diagnosis on your caseload. Or are you afraid of some diagnoses? Or maybe uh, you don't make the diagnosis because you don't want to have that conversation with the client about that specific diagnosis, you know, like antisocial personality disorder, dependent personality, borderline personality. Those can be difficult conversations to navigate as a clinician and with a client. Will you struggle to communicate a diagnosis assuming how a client will perceive it? Or will you use the ethics code to justify not communicating it, justifying that it will harm them when it could or would really help them? You know, how you navigate this will impact your work. And all of these crucial considerations are just, you know, really important to keep in the back of your mind. And this sort of plays into my next point, which is our role as the professional. We have to be aware of our feelings and our bias in everything we do. When you think about the therapeutic relationship, you know, it's crucial to the work. You need to know your own stuff and how it's impacting you and how it's impacting the client. Supervision can help you with this if you're not sure where to start, or even if you're already doing the work. Uh, personal counseling, you know, get yourself your own counselor. That can help with a lot of the stuff you might see bubbling up through the work that you're doing with clients and, you know, really expect that things will bubble up. You're human. You're not a robot. You should have feelings. You should be impacted by the work that you're doing. We're wrestling with healing souls over here. So it would be impossible to do this job and also be unimpacted. So I'll just get off my soapbox here. Um, but, you know, we really can't do any of those things if we're not aware of where we are in time and space and self and personal identity. You have an ethical obligation to your clients and the community at large, and I know the ethics code is not the most exciting information out there. It's dry to read, and you know it's a little bit of common sense. If you sat down and really thought about it, you might be able to come up with the stuff on your own, but it's there to guide us and put some boundaries and protections around the profession and make sure that everybody is acting in a, in a generally similarly way. So as I've discussed, the DSM changes. When I was in grad school, um, the DSM 4 TR was all the rage, and then the 5 came out, and now the 5 TR. And people still can't decide what should really be in it, like um, CPTSD. <laughs> but from the 4 to 5, Asperger's disappeared, and then intermittent explosive disorder and premenstrual dysphoric disorder emerged. And, you know, we have this obligation to stay current. And you have an obligation for motivating your own thirst for knowledge. You won't be in school forever, yay, but you will move on and you won't have professors to guide you. Supervisors should be incorporating some of this, but the obligation and responsibility ultimately falls to you for continuing your education and staying current. Do you value your growth edges? Are you aware of them? Are you going to pick your continuing ed based on what's easier or what's necessary? You certainly can skate through the rest of your time here and after you graduate, 
But I think having a clear purpose in mind of why you got in this field to begin with will help you stay motivated, focused, and intentional with what you do years down the road. The opportunity for a solid therapeutic alliance starts at the very first phone call or email, and it continues on into that first session and then into the communication of the diagnosis. We have this unique opportunity to help the client navigate self-awareness, self-understanding, and maybe for the first time in their lives, be a collaborator in their own treatment. And, you know, don't take that lightly. This can be really huge for people, you know, and maybe reflect on your own life for a second and think about how often doctors, teachers, supervisors, managers, you know, not only asked for, but demanded that you were involved with your own treatment or work. And if it's often, consider yourself lucky and privileged. For the folks we see, especially some with high ACE scores or trauma, it really might not be that often at all. And so this also might be a really new process for them that you're asking them what they think. So now what? What does this involve long-term? How do we make these determinations and feel comfortable? We'll use the DSM-5 and that gives us common language and we listen to our clients and we explore it with them collaboratively. We look for more what, than what the clients are saying. We look for behavior and nonverbal communication. We think about descriptive symptoms, somatic symptoms. We ask them how they're feeling. And when we're looking at a client history, you know, where have you been? What have you been a witness to? Let's talk about your experiences. Let's start to make connections between your past and your present. This is not a passive process that you can float through. Diagnosis is an intentional process we walk through with our clients based on getting to know them, uh, starting often before the first session, and confidence is gained with competence. Now, that being said, I mentioned that being good enough, um, not being a perfectionist, you know, no one is perfect and things will change. The more you get to know your client, the longer and the more likely you are to see more pervasive disorders like a personality disorder emerging because you're now observing somebody's behavior, their personality, how they interact with the world and over time a diagnosis can change. So, you know, that's part of why the DSM uses these continuums or spectrums, mild, moderate, severe. Clients evolve and change. Or maybe when you were starting to work with a client, they were seeing you for depression or general anxiety, but then something traumatic happens and that can change the game in the diagnosis. You know, the longer we know and grow, the more knowledge we have, and the more knowledge we have, the more comprehensive we can be. We can't be afraid of changing. We have to be aware that what we're doing is in the best interest of the client, and it takes time to get to know our clients. People open up more the longer the relationship goes on, and when we move from that assessment stage to that working stage. So this is the part where we're going to start talking about what this might be like for a client. Um, and it's a really human aspect of the job is considering, you know, not only are we looking at this book of diagnostic criteria and trying to like check off boxes and make a diagnosis so that we can get paid and for all these other reasons, but really understanding what it might feel like to be on the other side of receiving the news of a diagnosis. And for each individual, it's going to be different, but there's some common things that people tend to report experiencing when they receive a diagnosis for the first time. And so like we talked about before, you could bring this sense of relief, like, okay, what I have is known, it has a name, other people have this thing too, I'm not alone in this. Another thing that people report experiencing is that they don't really feel like they're, the symptoms of their diagnosis match with their experience. And for some of them, they don't match. And that's totally normal to feel like there's no direct line um, and that there's a little bit of a mismatch in the description of the diagnosis versus what you're experiencing. So again, you want to talk to them. You want to have that conversation about what's going on. Another thing too is that you might get some information um, and have the feeling that you're doomed in the diagnosis. Like that's really a death knell for the rest of your life and there's really no way out of it. And I think that's really important for you um, or somebody, anybody who's recently received a diagnosis or that, you know, you're in that realm of giving the diagnosis, just like, you know, it's going to be okay. You're here now. There are effective treatments for quite a few diagnoses out there, um, and you're not necessarily stuck in that space forever. And I think that some people sort of recognize or think, you know, the diagnosis is their identity and they have to live with it. 
And, you know, it's really just meant to be more informative in terms of, okay, this is what we're currently seeing. How do we move forward with this? And honestly, a lot of mental health diagnoses are very temporary now for some people who, you know, they don't really live with them their whole life. But many people experience something in the course of, you know, a couple years or maybe one year. And then especially with treatment, they get better and they'll move on and go back to living the life that they want to live. And maybe all of those symptoms have resolved. So I just wanted to reiterate that point that, you know, there can feel like this sort of sense of doom and gloom and it, it really doesn't have to be your identity. Other common experiences, just feeling that the diagnosis is incorrect altogether and especially thinking, well, if it's this other thing that seems like that, you know, it has a whole lot of the same symptoms and, you know, that's a perfectly valid concern for a client and you should be welcoming your clients in communicating their concerns with you. It may help you um, to do some differential diagnosis thinking or may provide you with even more information that you didn't previously have. Ultimately, it will help the therapeutic relationship to grow as you're there to listen and collaboratively discuss with the client their needs. And, you know, there's no perfect diagnostician, if that's a word. I don't know if that's a word. Um, but you're not going to be able to do this easily. And maybe your client will help you catch some mistakes or errors in judgment. Um, and you're going to learn progress, not perfection, right? Another thing that you might experience is, you know, the client might feel fear or anger having or having difficulty accepting it. Um, some people get into a denial phase. And, you know, if you've worked with families that receive a diagnosis for their child, they might go through a grief stage because they're grieving all the things that could have been and, you know, that they feel like they might never have the opportunity to have now, that it's a little bit more official, a little bit more final. And so you might experience some of that. And so it's important to recognize that, you know, this is something that might bubble up when you first um, tell somebody the words that they have a diagnosis. And, you know, it's also an opportunity. There's a lot of potential here too. So, you know, honoring the grief, but also honoring the potential is going to be really important. Um, and as we mentioned before, there can certainly be the sense of relief and hope after hearing, you know, whatever they're experiencing has a name. So, you know, that's something that people report feeling a little bit of relief from their diagnosis. Um, it's not just all of these bad things on the slide. Um, and the last point that I wanted to make is, you know, there's this small portion of people who actually feel a bit of glee and a rush at having something to cling on to as a source of their identity, which is then having a diagnosis. And, you know, I don't really want to indicate that this is most people at all. This is going to be an extremely small fraction of people. And there will be a small amount of people who, you know, upon hearing a diagnosis, think, yes, this is who I get to be. And then, um, like having a sort of clear identity to cling to now. And again, it's pretty infrequent. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of double back and say, you know, nobody's a perfect diagnostician. All of these things might happen and, you know, they can feel really uncomfortable to be in that space with the client as they're moving through these uncomfortable feelings. But it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're wrong. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're right either. So with all that being said, we want to consider, um, you know, what it's like to receive the news of the diagnosis when we are communicating the diagnosis to the client. And it can sometimes be very difficult. And there's some things at the forefront of this. You know, we really want to lean into empathy, honesty, clarity, being clear in what we're saying, making sure that they're understanding and being comprehensive and checking in with the client about how they feel. Do they agree? Do they disagree? You know, giving them space to sort of hold, hold all of those feelings that they might be experiencing on the previous slide. Um, so it's just sort of all of that communication process. And it can be really difficult to give a diagnosis and have that open, honest conversation with your client or with their family. It can feel uncomfortable for you. It can feel foreign, especially the first time you're doing it. Um, but it can offer a client hope and a starting place to spring forward from. It can offer, you know, a way to see the future because now we understand how we got there and how we can dig out together. It helps guide treatment. And in communicating a diagnosis, we also have to get comfortable communicating, you know, when a client might possess more than one diagnosis, like something that's a co-occurring disorder. 
So all of this will come in time, but I want you to understand the process, your role in the process, the choices that you have, and normalize some of the anxiety that's tied around this diagnostic process. It's okay to be anxious. It's okay to say, I'm not sure what to do, but that's when we lean into supervision and we lean forward in our discomfort and grow. It's when we open those lines of communication with our clients and really pull towards that collaborative approach. You know, especially when we talk about conduct disorders in this model, module. Um, that's a hard diagnosis to give an individual or a family um, and really start thinking through some of the things that we talked about. How do you feel about a diagnosis like that? How might the client feel? How might you assess it? How do you come up to the conclusions? How do you process this? Those are all things that can tie into our activity this week and the other lecture in module three. So here are some sort of just bonus questions for considerations because ultimately, despite um, there being this DSM Bible of disorders and diagnostic content, the process can really be quite subjective. So how you answer these questions will help guide you in understanding where you're coming from, your beliefs, your growth edges, all of that. So maybe just kind of think about these for a second. So you're complete with this lecture, and if you haven't viewed the lecture yet on disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders, go ahead and jump into that. You'll see that you know a lot of this links to that one quite a bit. Um, there's also videos for you to view under reading and multimedia, as well as some journal articles, and there's supplemental materials that'll help us tie further information together and really help us to communicate diagnoses better with our clients. You know, as always, call me, email me, get in touch with me. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, and I re look really uh, forward to meeting you all this week in person. You know, I'll see you at the South Point campus on Thursday and we can pick up with a little bit more of this.